protections from government. The question of privacy ultimately falls under the philosophical quandary of whether the common good outweighs individual liberties. Aristotle believed that all virtue lay between two vices, that of deficiency and that of excess. We believe that privacy and security must be similarly balanced. The difficult times we are facing now do good to remind us of the sacrifices we must make to protect one another. However, history shows that moments of fear and pandemonium are often exploited to carve away at fundamental rights such as privacy. Recent events such as Cambridge Analytica scandal in 2016, the Equifax breach in 2017, and recent proposals of digital COVID-19 contact tracing have left the American public on edge. In light of these events and others, we disagree with Richard Posner's view. We believe he is saying Americans are foolish for holding their rights to privacy in such high regard and should be more concerned with other issues. We believe Americans are and rightfully should be worried about invasions of privacy, especially in the digital age. The right to privacy formally began in England as common law and has evolved into privacy as we know it today, the right to be left alone. The allusion to the right to privacy in the First, Fourth, Fifth, and Ninth Amendments became explicitly entwined in Griswold v. Connecticut, which established that the Bill of Rights, rights collectively created penumbras or zones of privacy. This ruling was further strengthened by Eisenstadt v. Boyd, which ascertained that privacy extended beyond married couples to individuals. Perhaps the most famous and controversial case is Roe v. Wade, which determined that the fundamental right to privacy protected a woman's bodily autonomy and allowed her to choose whether to have an abortion. The courts have also been forced to recognize the concept of a reasonable expectation of privacy as introduced by the case Katz v. U.S. Since these cases, however, privacy has become increasingly endangered. States' recent attempts at enacting abortion bans could potentially present a dangerous opportunity to overturn Roe v. Wade, in turn restricting our fundamental rights. Furthermore, anti-terror laws like the Patriot Act have se seriously decreased the amount of privacy afforded to American citizens online. Claiming an anti-terror interest, the government now has access to metadata, which they may collect and store for up to 30 days as prescribed by Section 215, a section that is, like many others, still in effect 15 years after the planned sunset date. In a world that is estimated to produce quintillions of bytes of data every single day, legislation is simply not able to keep up. The 2017 case, Carpenter v. U.S., ruled that cell site information acquired without a warrant is no longer permissible under the third party doctrine. However, the indecisive 5-4 ruling of this case leaves the future of our privacy in the air. During the 2016 Apple v. FBI's case, Apple's refusal of the FBI's demands to create software to unlock the terrorist phone left the question to what extent the police private industry mostly unanswered. Invading the privacy by business is also a pressing issue, even more complex than that of government invasions. Technically, we could have as much privacy as we want from businesses, specifically online social media platforms and technology providers, if we simply refuse their services. However, the private sector presents an illusion of choice here as being off the grid is becoming increasingly implausible in the modern age. One example is the use of online educational services now mandatory for a large majority of American students. Precedent has established that privacy can be reasonably sacrificed in certain settings, such as airports, schools, and roads, to protect the public good. However, it is evident that the U.S. government has failed to protect our privacy from corporations and rogue individuals while treading on the right to privacy itself through anti-terror legislation that has overstayed its welcome. Thank you. Julia, you're muted. The NSA claims that it doesn't use its own technology against American students. But as Edwards noted himself stated, the NSA is essentially stating, while I have a gun pointed to your head, I'm not going to pull the trigger. Trust me. Thank you. We have some follow-up questions. You mentioned that it's impossible to be off the grid because you're forced to be on online platforms. Do you think that there's a way that legislation could be passed that would allow you to engage in certain activities without giving up your consent to privacy? I do think that it would be possible for legislation to be passed that would in some way, if not restrict businesses, at least make them more clear in the ways that they are restricting our privacy. Because in a lot of times, I think that we click buttons saying, yes, I read the uh, terms and conditions. Yes, I agree to use cookies without even really 
noticing or understanding what rights we're giving up. So I think if legislation was even just passed saying, hey, you need to make um, what you're stating and what you're taking away in their privacy more clear when you ask them to agree to these terms and conditions, then in many ways our privacy would be protected um, to a greater extent. Should we be concerned about our own government's gathering of this kind of information if we know that foreign actors, including foreign governments, are gathering the same information uh, in violation of our privacy? I think what's important to know is we are not other countries simply because a more, I think, a totalitarian state such as China is doing these kind of surveillance programs doesn't mean that the US needs to do it also. For example, um, because of um, COVID-19 in China, they're doing contact tracing, which is a, sim a similar thing, a digital contact tracing, and a similar thing has been proposed in the US. And I think um, that we just need just be that, yeah. <laughs> I think we must hold ourselves to a higher standard than other countries, and I think we must steep and withhold ourselves to the rights that are protected by the Bill of Rights for the people. Given the fact that those privacy rights, our privacy rights are not absolute, and you mentioned that the federal government has failed, what solutions then do you suggest in response to the gov federal government's failure? Well, I agree with what one of my colleagues said earlier, where we need to pass some sort of legislation in terms of making it more clear to businesses that they have to make it clear to us as users and consumers that we are giving up some of our privacy in return for being able to use their services. Because as my colleague said, many times we are asked to agree to terms and conditions of privacy, connect to cookies and other things of that nature. And we don't really understand quite what it is that we're giving up. I think it's on the government in part to help educate the people in a better sense so that we are aware that we are giving up these rights in part to have access to these services. Another thing that I would like to mention is actually a case I find interesting, Epic v. FBI, in which um, Epic tried, a, it's a website of sorts, tried to sue the FBI for violating their own uh, agreement and so I think, uh, going back to what my colleague was saying about us needing to rise to a higher level, another way that we can answer these privacy concerns is just having our government hold itself to the standards that it put in place. Because in this uh, court case, um, the FBI had violated its own agreement to tell um, citizens if they had looked through their emails after sort of violating someone's privacy, actually many citizens' privacy, in the attempt to find out whether Russians really were involved in the 2016 election. So even just something like the government actually following its own regulations could go a long way in helping provide our privacy. Um, I think another solution that could be repealing outdated um, anti-terror legislation, such as the Patriot Act, because there's one section, section 215, that basically give, grants the government the power to basically access any sort of tangible um, records, such as metadata or physical records, um, if they claim an anti-terror um, interest. And they can really access these records without even um, explaining exactly what they're doing. And it's proven that n this legislation has turned over exactly no terrorists and has stopped no um, um, imminent attacks. Do you think it is more important to protect the common good from whether foreign or domestic terrorists or our privacy? I think it's important to ride a balance between the two like we stated in the beginning of our piece, you shouldn't give up all of your privacy for public good or give up all of public good in order to maintain your privacy. I think there are lines that we can walk in which there are reasonable situations, for example, when we don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, um, when you can give up bits and pieces of your privacy in order to maintain a public good without going so far as to give the government uh, basically un, uh, 
like unobstructed access to our metadata or something obscene like that. Well, let's give you guys a round of applause. I just want to let you know how much I appreciate you guys stepping up to the plate and doing this in such an unorthodox way. Uh, being an a We The People alum, I know how challenging it is just doing it in person. Now let's add this extra layer of technology and you guys having to work remote. And I, I just want to let you know how impressed I am that not only that you guys pulled this together in such uncertain times, but that you took relevant examples such as the COVID-19 tracing and wove that into this argument, which means that you guys are following this, that you're staying up to date and that you're utilizing all these important things that are happening right in front of you and that you're staying informed instead of just saying, well, I'm just going to use this time for my distance learning and catch up on Tiger King on Netflix right now. So kudos to you guys. Um, I love, I love judging. I'm so glad to be a part of this with you guys and keep it up. And, and I look forward uh, to seeing you guys. I don't think we get to see you tomorrow on like at the national level like we usually do, but good luck. I agree with the congratulations you have given. It is very exciting to me that people your age are very concerned with such important current issues. I think you've done a good job of talking about the present situation. Uh, your, your presentation was replete, starting with the uh, quote from William Douglas, and then you go on to Griswold, Eisenstadt, Katz, Apple, uh, Epic, and Carpenter. Do read Carpenter again because it does talk about limiting government access to under the third party doctrine. Uh, cell phone pings are not accessible by the government without a warrant. And that's a 2018 decision. I think it is important in terms of limiting what the government can do. But you have also pointed out the fact that it isn't just governments who are involved here. Google, um, harvest millions and millions of bits of data every single day. They use it for, to disclose to government. They use it to market their products and sell to others who market their products to those who use their website. Um, I do think that it is both a governmental and an economic issue that we are dealing with here. It is a very important issue that's going to have to be sincerely addressed during your lifetime. You may want to know that I began with dial telephones. Uh, there, were, there were no tracking devices on my dial telephone, I can assure you. But take this knowledge and go forth. Use this knowledge to help change society. If you can use this knowledge, it is for the benefit of our common good. Please be politically active. Please stay current with your study of these materials. And please make yourself a source of information for your fellow citizens. Thank you for your hard work and your presentation. I also commend you on a job well done. You are the technological age, and certainly you've demonstrated your resiliency and your determination, given our current situation. I do appreciate the, your knowledge and your discussion. I appreciate particularly your responsiveness as to what can be done. We can always say someone else is to be blamed, you pointed out to repealing outdated legislation. It's up to your generation to make those differences and to change the current situation. And I have to correct less, even though they couldn't under the old dial phones uh, get our data like they can on cell phone pinging, they did wiretaps by different means. So there was different technology at the time. But again, well done. Good luck to you and I commend you on a bright future based on what you've demonstrated today. Thank you. All right, one more round of applause. Wonderful job, you guys. Again, seriously, it's, it's really tough to, um, to do all of this digitally and virtually, and um, you, you should be proud of yourselves. And you will now be experts in what is going to probably be the future of, um, of education with using this this virtual format um i, I see it, it becoming more and more important um, in our world so congratulations